applications, uh, Jose, in terms of the cross linking that's so important to us today in terms of stabilizing and strengthening the cornea. And then Roger will again show you some illustrations about the dynamics of how the BSF changes on the retina and stuff. Well, when we talk about this, as I will tell you, uh, I named this talk the other side of vision, the dark side, because we never talk about light scattering. And what we'll see, and what I hope by the time that this is over, you'll realize that light scatter is the predominant factor that determines the quality of vision on our retina. And we don't even measure that today, and I'll illustrate that to you. Now the first thing that we do is look at a simple diagram that we have here that shows us that basically when we're looking at an object of regard that you see here where we have an image on the phobia, if we have a pair of headlights or something off to the side like this truck driving down the street, what you see is that the uh, image of that glare source is actually perfect image on a peripheral retina. And if you have clear medium, if there's no light scatter from the ocular structures in your eye, has no effect on the macular image. So in other words, when I'm looking at another car down the road, if a car from the side comes in, the image of the headlights are on the periphery, and it has no effect on the central image in terms of its contrast. <coughs> now, light scatter, on the other hand, is something where we have an object. Again, we can have a glare source, but the scatter can actually be from uh, the glare source itself. And so what we see here is the light scatter can actually occur between us and the object in the air, and we'll see some of the things that do that. Dust, water droplets, makes fog. Uh, we'll see some illustrations of sand that causes that, pollution. All of those things cause light scatter in our atmosphere between us and the object. We usually refer to that when it happens as glare. And then the cornea, the aqueous, the crystalline lens, and the vitreous also scatter light. The cornea, the anterior surface, stroma, and endothelial, we'll see examples of those clinically. The aqueous, when we have protein and cells leaking from the vessels from inflammation, we get scattered. And the crystalline lens, as the fibers within the crystalline lens begin to deteriorate, they also scatter more and more light. And the vitreous, with asteroid hyalosis and cinerasis scintillans, also cause scatter. And in fact, even in a normal individual with perfect eyesight at 19, you still have scattered light but it's so small that it doesn't affect our vision significantly. Now one thing that's true is that the scatter of light is proportional to the fourth order of the wavelength of light. Now you say, what do I mean by that? It means that if you take the wavelength of light to the fourth order, it is going to tell you that blue light scatters to the fourth power more than red light because the wavelength of red light is, I mean, red light is longer than it is for blue light. Red light's about 700 nanometers and blue light's about 400. But here's what happens. When we send light through an aperture, like the pupil, here's what comes out the other side. It automatically scatters, and that scatter, which Lord Raleigh showed us there, happens any time it passes through an aperture, so we have light scatter all the time. And related to the amount of light scatter, blue light at about 400 here in our atmosphere looks like this, and red light is scattered almost six to eight times less just because the wavelength is so much longer, and that's why our sky is blue. Because the light scatter is so much preferential for blue light that we end up with this blue sky from light from the sun coming down, hitting the dust particles that are in our atmosphere, and blue light scatters eight times more than red or yellow light, and as a result, as you can see, you get a darker and darker blue sky as you look up. Now, the type of thing that bothers us, as you see here, this is veiling glare from fog. In other words, when you're out at night or even in the daytime driving and you have little water droplets in the air, well, they scatter the light. And as a result, those things that are closer to you, the amount of water between you and a close tree there, you can see. But as it gets farther and farther away, it's hitting more and more water droplets. And the result is you can't see more than about 100 feet in front of you. 
And in fact, it's why you learn to dim your lights and turn them down. Because if you try to shine the light out, it hits those water droplets and reflects and scatters even more so that you can't see anything. Now this is light scatter that's outside the eye. And again, these are just images in my front yard. You can see again that the light scatter from when you have a hazy, rainy day. And uh, there's just a water droplet that's right in front of you that's about uh, six inches in front of the lens. And you can see it gets, creates an image of the, this was at Christmas time. But again, you see the farther we look, the more, the lower the contrast. And one of the things that those of you that wear spectacles, uh, when you walk outside and your glasses were warm inside and or they were cool and you walk outside on a hot day in Houston, well, that humidity gets on that cold glass and it condenses and all of a sudden you can't see anything because now the scatter is from the condensation of the water on the surface of your glasses. So all of these things create glare. And here we are in Dubai. Now it's absolutely a perfectly clear day, but you cannot see those buildings. And the reason is there's little bitty particles of sand in the desert that's up in that sky, and the farther away they are, the more particles of sand. And if we were in some place like Phoenix, Arizona, or some place that didn't have sand in the sky, you'd see those buildings as clear as if uh, you were standing next to them. So again, these are all examples of glare, thank you, of glare and scatter that's a result of things in the air. Now as we move into the eye, we have a cornea, and the cornea, as you know, is made up of these long corneal fibers that go from limbus to limbus, and they actually go in little lamellae, and the reason for that is one of the characteristics of something being transparent is that it has to have a lot of space in it. So, uh, lattice works like glass, and glass is sort of looks like a, uh, something like this. This is what the structure of glass looks like. It's just like monkey bars that we played on as a kid. Now, from this angle, you see if I took a shotgun, and a shotgun with little pellets or BBs, and I shot that, I'd hit a lot of those bars. But if I get off to the side and I shoot down the part of that monkey gym, that's through the spaces between there, so I'm coming from this direction, the area that's clear is 99% and I can get through and have very few collisions. So, for example, also the cornea. The collagen fibers in the cornea are exactly the same chemically as those in the sclera. The only difference is the ones in the cornea are arranged like a lattice work, and it's a little more complicated than that. But the fact is that lattice structure and these lamellae that we form here, and you can see here, here's our collagen fibers and they're just like that monkey gym. We've got a lot of air space in here. And the reason why, for example, in glass, when you melt it down and you get it to where it's moving and then let it solidify, is again, it forms the lattice work so the spaces for the photons to go through don't scatter as much. And here again is a rabbit at four days, at four months, and you begin to see the cornea clearing, and it's a result of the keratocytes in the cornea having lined up so they let the light through. Now, the cornea is the first structure in the eye that scatters light. And if we have somebody that did a PRK, and they didn't use enough steroids, and they happen to be something that scars, you get this reticular formation of scarring on the anterior surface, and that scatters light just like that sand we saw in Dubai. And so those patients will tell you that it doesn't change the wave front. In other words, <laughs> the contour of the light as it goes through stays exactly the same, but you get scattered. You get these little particles that go in every direction, and we'll see a little bit better the illustration of that. Here's the endothelium. This is an endotheliolitis. And as a result, the endothelium does the same thing. When it swells up and gets inflamed, gets little white cells on it, it begins to scatter light also. Today we have shine flu that allows us to see that, and it works by light scatter. This whole image that you see here is a result of taking a picture of the light scatter. If there were no scatter in these structures, you wouldn't see anything. And what we see here, there's a little peak on the front, 
because the collagen fibers in the cornea are in the lamellae except right under at Bowman's membrane, the pellucida nigra. And what that is, it's the area where the fibers come up and they begin to intertwine and it's like a rope. When you have a rope and you don't twist the fibers like this, I can get through easier, but to make it strong, what do you do? You twist that rope so all of those little fibers are working together and it makes the rope a hundred times stronger than when they're lined up in parallel. And the result is the same way in the cornea. That little sub-membrane below Bowman's is a result of those intertwining fibers giving the cornea strength, but it causes light scatter because it's no longer that latticework structure that we saw on the monkey bar. Now, it's normal the fibers in the crystalline lens are not like that monkey gem, they cross. And in fact, we have that erect Y suture in front, we have the inverted Y suture in the back, and the result is, as light passes through here, it goes through fairly efficiently, but that causes scatter. It's perpendicular to those fibers, and that's why we see a six-pointed star, is because the collagen or the lens fibers are arranged in this, so we get scattered perpendicular to these, scattered perpendicular to those, and scattered perpendicular here. So we see a six-pointed star if you have an absolutely perfect direct and inverted Y suture. Now, if they're off a little bit, you'll see a five-pointed star or a seven-pointed star, the reason for different things in our religions. All of that's a result of the difference in the erect and the inverted Y suture. If everybody were perfect, we'd all see six-pointed stars. Nobody would draw those little five-pointed stars. So the point is that we do get scattered from that normally. Now, remember this picture that we drew at the beginning that says that image on the retinous periphery? Well, once we move back to the lens, and we have light that hits that, as the lens begins to lose its transparency as we age because of the misarrangement of the lens fibers, bingo, we get light scatter. And that light scatter falls on top of the macular image, it falls on top of that glare source, and the result is the contrast of the image that we see is reduced from the scattered light from every other object that's in our visual field. Every one. So the point is here, this is what you see before you get a cataract or have a light scatter, and this is what you see, and you can see exactly why, and no other commercial instrument measures that scatter. Not one. It's the most important thing in the contrast of the retinal image, and we never measure it. Now let me show you some things. So again, when we look here at the scatter of the lens and the cornea, you see that little peak right here? Well, that's the cornea. And that little thing right there is those twisted fibers just underneath. You see that little bright little thing right there? That's not a lacing flap. That's those twisted fibers giving strength to the cornea in the front. And in the crystal lens, you see where the scatter is. These are the amount of scatter that you get from those little things. And again, it's from those fibers having to generate. Nuclear sclerotic cataract, the previous was a coronal cataract. And when we get uh, opacification of the capsule, you can get the, the type that causes a foamy degeneration. You don't see little lines and it's not gray, it's just this little foam-like stuff out there. Well, that causes them to see that scatter that we saw. And then if the lens fibers do proliferate and don't change into myofibroblasts, you get this kind of appearance. And that's what causes you to see the streak perpendicular to these little high plus uh, fibers that are there. If the capsule stays like this and is wrinkled, it's like a piece of cellophane. You can wrinkle a piece of cellophane and it's still clear. You still don't get any scatter. It's when those lens fibers go across that we get the light scatter. Glistenings in our acrylic lenses. Those little glistenings that we see in there are just like those pieces of sand we saw in Dubai. That causes forward light scatter. It doesn't change the wave front one iota. In other words, the reason why nobody can pick up that the glistenings affect the vision is when you do a wave front on it, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't change the rays that go between them. It just scatters light and it goes all over that wave front image, but it doesn't change. So people say, well, gee, it has no effect on vision because look at the wave front. They're identical with and without the glistenings because it doesn't measure scatter. 
Now, apartment jack, all right? Single pass, you got a light source that you projected back, goes to the lens and cornea, you got these little lenses, and then you got a camera back here that takes a picture of that, all right? So the light's coming from this point source and coming out, and as I said, when you look at the points that you see here, those points on that person that we just saw don't move. This is a picture of keratoconus. Now let's blow that up a little bit. Now what do you notice? Those lenslets that are measuring the light, the way Wavefront works is what you do is you know that it should be a perfect grid, and what you do is you calculate the wavefront by how far those points have moved from where they're supposed to be. And how far they've moved away is a measure of the quality of the wavefront. Now, the point is that the scattered light doesn't change the position of those little uh, points at all. But what does it do? It makes the contrast of the background between those points go down. In other words, what happens is, we'll see when we look at some more pictures, that what we have there is the dots are in the same place, but now all of a sudden the contrast between the dot and the background is far reduced, and we'll see that. For example, this is what I'm saying. When you look at these two pictures, these pictures have their wave fronts at exactly the same point. Look at that. The dots are exactly the same. No difference whatsoever in those two pictures. The wave fronts are identical. But what the patient sees is this. When they are looking at night, instead of seeing an image that looks like this, they see an image that looks like this, and the wave front of this image is identical to the one on the right. And the reason is, all that's happened is light scatter, and every single point, if you go back and look at them, is just as resolved as the point in the picture that's clear, but it doesn't measure light scatter. It doesn't measure the contrast between those points. And the result is, the patient says, see, I can't see at night. I can't drive anymore. And that's because he's seeing this image, and what you're measuring has no influence on that whatsoever, so you don't pick anything up. Now you look in and you see a, uh, an early cataract, but there's no objective test that you have to corroborate the fact that you see that. Now again, with the OCUS, here's where Hartman Shack measures it. And that's okay, you can measure it up here. And the idea that you get a double pass filter and measure the retinal image is fine, but that doesn't matter. Even if you measure the retinal image, if you don't measure the glare and its effect on that point spread function on the retina, it's not any better than it is for a Hartman Shack. But a double pass, does go through and come back so you get this uh, measurement that if you do measure between those points like on a Hartman Jack, or better yet, when you measure the change in the contrast between the center point and a peripheral point, that change in contrast and the wave front together allow you to determine how much of it's scattered and how much of it's wave front. That's the principle that the OCUS does that no other instrument today performs. So it's not where it measures, it's what it measures. It measures light scatter and wavefront, not the fact that it's on the retina. Now this is the HD analyzer. We've changed it from Ocus uh, to be more contemporary HD. We know we're genes are we're genetically set up to see in HD, so the HD analyzer measures this dark side of vision as well as the wavefront. And it does use the double pass where it comes in and we actually have it where it passes and comes back. So it's double pass and we're analyzing the retinal image. And as I said, the parameter for objective scanner index, which is unique to the HD analyzer, is a number that is obtained from the relative intensity of the external area of the double pass image. In other words, what we're looking at out here is the ratio of the contrast of that center to the periphery where the light scatter actually reduces that contrast and we measure that difference. 
So the OSI is a measure of the scatter, and we'll see that the wave front is a measure of the rays that actually form the image. So let's look at that. Now, Pablo Artal, the uh, scientist that originated this and started everything, developed a scale, and so the ocular scatter index goes from 0 to 10. All right, 0 being perfect, there's no scatter, and 10 being as bad as you can get. And you can see the image here as it changes, going from 0 up to 10, and that's what we're actually analyzing. Now, one of the first studies that uh, he did was to take the lock scale that you see here and correlate that, and what he found was very simple that there was a direct correlation between, uh, well, this graph that you see in the upper left-hand corner is the ocular scatter index versus the lock scale, and what you see is the ocular scanner index is an exact measure of the quality of vision that the patient has from the cataract. The wavefront isn't, because if you have a lot of light scatter and some wavefront changes, it looks good, and if you have severe light scatter and the wavefront's only changed a little bit, it doesn't measure that, so there won't be a good correlation between wavefront and reduction of functional vision because it doesn't measure the light scatter, whereas the ocular scatter index does. Now, here's an example. The LOX-1 is a mild cataract. Here's a severe cataract, and the point is that that uh, ends up being uh, the best measure of the severity of a cataract. Now, to illustrate one other point, now I retired from clinical practice almost two years ago, but one of the last things I did was to take my HD analyzer, and I said, well, you know, it's interesting, because when we do LASIK on patients, femtosecond laser, everything's great, when they sit up on the table, they can look across the room and see that clock. It's immediate, the wow factor. The thing that makes them all say, gee, I'm so glad I had this because within a few minutes after getting up off that table, they're 20-20 vision. Well, that's true. But what we're going to see is the light scatter doesn't return right away, and they see like those patients with the cataract in terms of the contrast. Fortunately, that clock they're looking at is high contrast. If I had a 25% contrast chart, they wouldn't see that because they have a lot of light scattered. That's what we're going to see. All right, so here's what we have. I, what I did is I did LASIK on the patients. I walked them upstairs <coughs> to my clinic. Uh, within an hour after we did the LASIK, measured them on the uh, HD analyzer, and then we always see them back the next day. So I brought them back for a one-day post-operative visit to see what their pre-op OSI and wavefront were their one hour OSI and wavefront and what they were 24 hours later. So just to get you oriented here, the wavefront that we haven't really talked about, these are numbers at different spatial frequencies, okay? And what happens is it should be these are numbers are one point. One is what we would consider normal, better than one is a little better. And it's a measure of the wavefront and so it's the MTF if you will. But it's a measure of the wavefront. So 100% is normal, and higher than 100% is a little better. So what we see here is that this guy's got uh, good contrast. This is his right eye. And one hour after surgery, he's dropped down to numbers that are 0.38. So he's lost 70 to 80% of his contrast on his MDF one hour uh, after surgery. Now this is way from, okay? Now let's look at the ocular scatter index. Here it is again, pre-op 0.6. We said one was very good, so he's excellent. And it's four, one hour after surgery. So he can see 2020 in high contrast. Because he was, even though 0.38 is down, you can still see, well, that clock is probably 2040. But the point is, if I'd have waited another hour, but the point is that the contrast of what he sees is basically six times worse than it was before he had surgery, so his contrast sensitivity is a factor of six times worse one hour after surgery. And so the majority of the reduction in the quality of his vision is from the edema of the flap causing the scatter of light, and it has very little effect on the wavefront. 
Now, here it is in the left eye. Again, over one, so those are excellent. Here he is dropping down to about 30% again. Left eye. And here's his scatter index, 0.7 and 4.6. Again, a factor of seven times as much light scatter as his eye had before the surgery one hour later. Now let's see what happens by the next morning. We do the surgeries around noon, they're in about 8 o'clock, and here he is the next morning. Bingo. Now, one day after LASIK, this was the pre-op, this is the post-op, all of a sudden that guy's back to normal. His wave front is good. And, bingo, look at his ocular scatter index. All the corneal edema in that flap, not all of it, but most of it, is gone within 24 hours, and now that guy really does have 2020 vision, and his vision basically has returned to 2020, except his refractive error has gone from minus eight to zero. But what we see is that his vision from one hour to basically 18 hours of after surgery, the amount of edema in that flap and the light scatter, and the edema doesn't have to be more than about two or three percent, because just a little distortion in that lattice work all of a sudden changes that monkey gem from something where it's got a lot of holes to a lot of bars. And then what we saw is six times, and that resolved within 24 hours. Well, there's the left eye, the same thing. He's actually got better contrast sensitivity on his MTF uh, after surgery, and his scatter index was actually better the next morning. Now, that's say better. The fact is it's not statistically different, but the point is he returned to where he was preoperatively. And all that does is it gives us a very exquisite measure of what happens to the visual system within the first 24 hours. So we can map that thing hourly and see exactly what the rate of edema going down much more sensitively than OCT, because OCT tells us the thickness, but this tells us the optical effect of that swelling. Now, and there's the left eye, the same thing as contrast as, uh, uh, actually this is another patient, one eye. Again, uh, this person dropped down only, uh, whatever those numbers are, about 10%. Uh, well, he was 1.2, so he had a 30% drop in his wave front. He had, one hour later, he had a five, a four-fold increase in his OSI one hour after surgery. And again, when he comes back the next day, his contrasts have gone back up to normal, and the ocular scatter index hadn't quite come back to the 0.5 yet in 24 hours. But you see how sensitive the device is. So what I've tried to share with you this morning is this. The first thing is that light scatter, the other side of vision, the dark side that we never talk about, is the predominant thing that affects the visual acuity, not the acuity, the visual quality in the cornea and the crystalline lens are the two major factors, the two major regions of the eye where light scatter is the predominant factor determining the quality of vision. And what I was trying to show you here is basically that wave front has nothing to do with that. Wave front measures the change in rays that are still fairly coherent, but doesn't have anything to do with light scatter because light scatter is no longer coherent. That light's going in every direction, and it basically reduces the contrast of everything that you see on the retina. And that the only way to quantitate that functional vision loss and quality of vision is by measuring the amount of light scatter and that's what the HD analyzer does. And so with that ocular scatter index, we now have a variable that allows us to quantitate healing after refractive surgery, the effects of endotheliitis, epithelial edema, early cataracts, on and on and on. And these measures will be far superior to anything else we've had in the past and more importantly, it will help us explain to the patient who before this would have complaints of glare and loss of vision that we were not objectively able to support and prove. 
patient comes in, just like that one hour, he would have measured 2020. And I don't have an ocular scatter index. Well, I would say, well, gee, everything looks normal. Well, now you can tell him, I understand. You've got six times as much light scatter as you had before surgery, or you have because of corneal edema, or whatever. And the point is, now you have an objective instrument that can quantitate for you this value, and then prove to you and the patient what the cause of their vision quality loss is. So I hope today you've understood that, and I'd be glad to entertain any questions uh, that anybody might have on that. Probably put everybody to sleep this morning like that. I use the femtosecond laser. Femtosecond laser. In fact, the question was, uh, what you use for the flat on those cases? And it was femto, and at that time we had the 120. No, 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 we had the 60. But what you'll find is, well, it's not the one I compare it to. It's, or the femtosecond laser. When you lift that flap up, and by the time you put some drops of ESS and put that down, anybody with whatever tech that you need, the second you lift the flap and put it back down, those collagen fibers are have a little edema. And that edema is going to cause light scatter, and what this does is quantitates that for you, and it'd be a good study to see if it's different, but my suspicion would be it doesn't matter what you cut with, it's the fact that you lifted it and put it back down, and that change in the lattice structure of the cornea that takes about 16, 18 hours to come back will be there either way. Yes, sir? Well, how high are the operations, like the wave of so we can detect the high of the operations? Oh, right, yeah, now. The question was, what, what about the higher order aberrations? Don't the higher order aberrations have nothing to do? Absolutely not. Higher order, let's say we go up to eighth order aberrations, okay? Now all that means when we say eighth order, all right, means that the exponent of the monomial for the Zernike term or four-year series is up to about eight. So now, if you're looking at, say, a six millimeter diameter pupil, or say a four millimeter pupil, well, that eighth order is looking at things that are about a half a millimeter in terms of their spatial frequency, all right? And a half a millimeter, although it's eight times more than the diameter of that pupil, uh, it's still something that where a ray has bent enough to where it's not on the button, but it's off by an optical path difference of eight times more than it should be, all right? But that's still a ray that's coming close to the target. We're talking about, we're shooting at a target, and yes, that ray at eighth order that we call higher order aberrations, if you have a bullseye and the red's the center and the white's out in the periphery, yes, that ray is in the white, okay? Second orders would be in the yellow, fourth orders would be in the green, and eighth orders are gonna be out here in the white in terms of how far they've missed that target, okay? But they're still on the target. What we're talking about now with light scatter is if I took a bunch of BBs and shot a shotgun up and it came out and it lands all over everything, the target, the ground, and everything around that, that's light scatter, you see? And nothing to do with that target tells you anything other than all those BBs, yes, some of them did fall on that target. And they reduced the contrast between the length of that arrow and where the BBs fell. But they cannot, no, higher order aberrations are still orders and orders and orders of magnitude finer in terms of the scatter uh, and how they fall on the retina than even 20th order Zernikes. Is there any difference between the light scanning between the PRK flab by the PRK and what then? P PRK basic and uh, femtosecond. In terms of scatter? Yes. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, the question is, can the OSI pick up differences in PRK, LASIK, and other uh, techniques on the cornea? The answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely. Now, what we know is this, all right? That picture I told you of reticular uh, scarring that you got from a PRK, all right? Well, in PRK, where you put the laser energy on the stroma and you're not going to put the flap or anything back down on that, and it's the front surface, a person's uh, ability 
to uh, deal with that inflammation, the proportion amount of scarring that they get on that surface from absolutely nothing all the way up to that particular formation will be related directly to the OSI. And with PRK, in most people, unless they have some inflammatory response, and that's the reason why I use mitomycin and other things on retreatments, if you inhibit the um, inflammatory response on the surface of the cornea so that you don't get any scarring, well then, what it shows is that the amount of light scatter that you get from LASIK and PRK is no difference by, by at least a year and probably sooner. But what happens is, uh, at one year, the epithelial remodeling in PRK is actually a little better than LASIK. By two years, they're indistinguishable because the epithelial remodeling on the LASIK actually begins, it happens for that time. So in one year, so if you look at the curves, the visual quality and the light scatter for up to about